glad to see you all and to welcome you all back. And this small number is exactly what we want. We want lots of space in between everybody, and you're doing such a great job. Would you, would you uh, accept the invitation if I ask you to stand and sing uh, in church again? Would you be able to do that? <clears throat> Let's sing How Great Thou Art. <clears throat> Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Hadn't it been so good? Then sings my soul. His Son not sparing Sent Him to die I scarce can take it in That on that cross My burden gladly bearing He bled Sing like you've been wanting to. In sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. It sings my soul. Donna. It is well, men, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin. glorious thought. Think about it. My sin not in part but the whole has been nailed to the cross and I'll bear it no more. Sing, men. It is 
voices fill the room. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor, would you lead us in prayer? What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Feel the presence of God just in singing these songs. And we're so happy to see each and every one that are gathered here with us. And throughout the day, there'll be others come. And may we all be able to say we have been to the house of the Lord. Amen. In fact, the Bible talks about uh, thirsty. And uh, it's just like we're getting a fresh drink of water here singing these old hymns and feeling the presence of God and how we love you and good to see you and before I pray let me assure you that we are praying for Rich Fisher who is quite ill sister Phyllis Howard and Bobby Engel and many others shut in not able to be here may God overshadow and may God bless them and we're praying for our country and the leaders of our country and asking for divine guidance even in a time such as this. Heavenly Father, it's a joy to be upon this holy spot of ground and between these sacred walls. And thank you for each one that graces the building and those who are coming and those who will be coming later on. And oh, how we ask for your blessings, Lord. May your presence fill the house today. And may there be rejoicing in the hearts of your people. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. You've been with us. You walk with us, Lord. In the valley, in the time of uncertainty, Lord, you've been there. You provided for us, Lord. You've done so many wonderful things. We bless you and praise you and look forward to the service. May all of it, Lord, be anointed of you. And if there's one that know you not, may they come to know you. And maybe there may be someone who says, I just want to renew my covenant with God. May we all just be obedient to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And we all said, Amen. 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 Let's sing Redeemed. Sure. Mrs. Christine, would you come and help us sing Redeemed? <laughs> Out the service today, there may be somebody to say, I just want to say a word for the Lord. I want to thank God for what He's done for me. I want to thank God for His presence and His faithfulness. You just obey the Lord, amen? What could be more wonderful than coming to the house of God and all of us feeling the presence of God? And so, oh, how good it's been to be there. Oh, it's a time of refreshing, amen? I love the Lord. 
and I thank him for his blessing. Thank him for his goodness. And me and John both thank God for the way that he provided for us. Even in a time such as this, he's been faithful. Let's sing it. Amen. Sweet is the song I'm singing today. Yes, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Trouble and sorrow have vanished away. I have been. I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed. My love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. I have been. I have been redeemed. Great is my joy. As on when I go. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. All the way homeward, my prayer shall flow. I have been, I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed by love divine. I love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. I have been, I have been. Precious indeed, precious indeed is the Savior to me. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. Happy in glory, someday I'll be. I have been, I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. I have been, I have been redeemed. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can we do one more? Amen. Sure. I don't want to wear you out. We got two services today. Okay, go ahead. Okay, let's try just a little talk with Jesus. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry, he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn in, you know a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I once was lost in sin. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer, we'll turn it in. Oh, a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Think about verse 2. Sometimes my past seems drear without a ray of cheer. And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The 
the mist of sin may rise and hide the starry sky. Oh, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. You feel a little prayer will turn in. You know a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. the singing back in God's house? Can you imagine what it was like to be in exile and for David to say, I was glad when they said to me, now it's time and we can come back to the house of the Lord. I am so glad to be here. I'm, I'm maybe even more glad that you're here. I didn't know who would show up today. And everyone's got various concerns and rightfully so. But I, for me in my house, I am so glad to be uh, in the house of the Lord. Miss Linda, would you come up? And we're just going to have a little time of singing. I'm going to preach in a little bit. But um, we've not had any good singing live in, in about 12 weeks. And so if it's okay, we'll just sing. Would you sing this with us? God is so good. Get in these microphones, ladies. God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me, He answers. up there. So 
seated. You may be seated. Miss Lee, you sing anything that's on your heart. Miss Linda, if you want to join her, or if you want to sing something by yourself in a moment, you ladies just decide. Okay. I know I sing this a lot, but it really does, it's like a testimony to me. Where would we be without God's hand helping us through our day-to-day -day lives and especially through times like this, you know, these strange times that we're in, but he's faithful.
we see dimly who he is and what he is like. But one day we will see clearly. The Bible says that eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for them that love him. I don't know if you realize the last two songs that were sung, uh, three, four songs that were sung, they ha all had a verse about that great day when we will see him as he is. We will see him in heaven. And when we get there, Miss Ramona, we will see streets of gold. They won't just be regular streets and they won't just be regular gold. They will shout to us the glory of God. It won't just be regular gates of pearl. I know you've seen lots of gates of pearl. Everything there will scream the glory of God. And we will be shocked and amazed. We might even be ashamed at all of the glory that He is that we've been missing all these years. One day we will see Him. One day, one day soon. Could I invite you in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 18? Praise the Lord for His glory that He has let us in on. He has shown us. He has revealed Himself to us. He has blessed us. The book of Ephesians says, in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing. Hadn't God been good? Oh, thank Him for His unseen hand. How He has seen us through and is seeing us through these strange times. These times are not over. I don't know what normal will be, but I don't know that we will ever see it the way it was. I don't know that we need to. I think the Christian says, normal, <laughs> Lord have your way. If normal for you means comfortable, I'd rather let Jesus lead and be uncomfortable. And say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, have your way, do as you want, as uncomfortable as it might make me. You be God and I'll not be. Did you know that the Lord is doing something in this time? He is doing something that we are not privy to, but we are privy to this truth that He is doing His work. He always does, He always has, He always will accomplish His purposes. And it is through sometimes the strangest of means that he accomplishes his will. I mean, just think with me, if you will, about some of the means that the Lord has used to even save all of humanity. Oh, could we have ever dreamed up that God himself would become a human and give himself into the jurisdiction of evil and corrupt humans? and allow himself to be crucified and killed and buried in a tomb and, and to rise the third day. And when he rose, he would still be nail-pierced. He would still be able to look, say, look and see. And we would say, why is this part of the plan? Why, why, I don't understand this. Why would God is doing his work the way he wants to do it? And we are never privy to the greatness of his plan. We are called to walk by faith and not by sight. I mean, just think of how strange it must have been and how no one saw the purposes of God in the swallowing of Jonah in the whale. And the Lord says, this is just how I do my work. And there Jonah sat on the east side of Nineveh waiting for that city to be destroyed and the Lord sent a gourd to give shade by day and then he sent a worm to cut down the gourd. Lord, what do you do? This is how I do my work. It don't seem to make any sense. That's because you ain't God. I mean, the Lord waited till Moses was 80 years old before he called him to free the people of Israel from Egypt. 40 years old, he grew up there in Egypt. And then 40 years old, he was there on the backside of the desert serving his father-in-law and raising sheep. And 80 years old before the Lord said, here's what we're going to do with you, Moses. God is doing his work and we are never privy to it. Our job is to prepare ourselves so that when God reveals His will in our life, we are ready. I want to tell you today about a king named Hezekiah. Do you know Hezekiah? In the book of 2 Kings, it's say, he's just one of the kings in a litany of kings. 
And they are either categorized in one of two ways. They are either categorized as a king, and it'll tell you at the beginning of that chapter when it says, this king in this year came on the scene, and he did that which was either right in the sight of the Lord or evil in the sight of the Lord. That's just all that we have about these kings. Now, his daddy was named Ahaz. King Ahaz was a terrible king, a bad king, and the Bible tells us in 2 Kings 16 that when he came on the scene, he did that which displeased the Lord. He promoted idol worship, and he promoted idolatry, and he led Israel, he led Judah, in a wrong way. Now Hezekiah, his son, is born, and we are told about him in 2 Kings 18. Would you turn there with me? And I want us to look and see how that God prepared Hezekiah for a shutdown 15 years in advance. Did you know that God might be preparing us right now for the next shutdown? Do you think this is going to happen again? Do you think God's plan is going to continue to unfold and we won't understand exactly what's going on? We won't. That's okay. It's our job to model ourselves like Hezekiah. He's going to be a good example for us today to say, Lord, what should I be doing in the strangest of times? Let's read the word of the Lord together. 2 Kings 18, verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Eliah, king of Israel, that Ezekiah, Um, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, he began to reign. Twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. And this is in Judah, the southern half, after the kingdom had been split. They're in the southern half where the capital Jerusalem is. His mother's name was Abbi, or Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3 tells us something like it tells us of the rest of the kings. And he did that which was what? Right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. David was his forefather, his spiritual father. David the second king of Israel. Verse 4 says, He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. And we'll stop there today, and this will be our reading, the reading of the word of the Lord for us. Hezekiah comes on the scene. The Bible tells us that he was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He did that which was right. Hezekiah, I want to liken him to you and I today. Now he lived some thousands of years ago in a different culture, in a different context, but what has not changed is that God made him and God made you. You see the similarity there? He was born of a woman the same way that you were. The call of God was on his life the same way as it's on you. You have responsibility to serve the Lord the same way Hezekiah did. And you're here this morning because you have a desire to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. We all have responsibility in the way in which we live our lives. And little do we know it, but every day we are either doing something in preparation for the next shutdown, we are either laying strong spiritual foundations, or we are eating cotton candy spiritually. My dad told me that great piece of advice some years ago. He said, every time you sit down at a meal, it's a chance to do something good for your body. And what he was saying is, you know, look for the broccoli, look for the Brussels sprouts, look for that high protein, look for that steak, look for that chicken. Feed yourself something good. Corn on the cob, or as Ricky likes to call it, corn on the bone. Every day that we wake up, We are charged with the responsibility to follow the Lord, to say, Lord, lead me, to do the right things. Did you know the Bible says that they that follow the Lord will be strong? That's what Psalm number one says. 
Psalm number one says that the righteous will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. They shall be prosperous, they shall be fruit-bearing, they shall be resilient, they shall be strong, they shall be fed. Little did Hezekiah know that when he comes on the scene and begins to behave himself properly, he is laying the foundation that he will benefit from later on. What's going to happen in the reign of Hezekiah, in the life of Hezekiah, is that the Assyrian army, which was in the process of conquering the northern kingdom of Israel, and they ruled the whole world. They were, they were absolutely massive. The historians tell us that the Assyrian army, they were like locusts. They were so vast in number, and they could absolutely overwhelm any government they wanted to. They are going to come against Hezekiah in Judah the same way they are doing against Israel. And God is going to deliver Hezekiah. He's going to deliver all of Judah, all of Israel. Because of the groundwork that Hezekiah is laying early on in his life. Let me tell you two things that Hezekiah did that we must do too. Would you look in your Bible? The Bible says in verse 3 that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Brother Kevin, if I can have some monitor, I'll probably go horse. Not as quick. Verse 4 says, he removed the high places. Now, in, in olden times, the high places were places of idolatry. They were uh, altars built to foreign gods, other gods. They were often on hilltops or mountaintops. They were often literally high places, though not always. The reason that Ahaz was a bad king is because he allowed these high places to stand. These high places were not just innocent. It wasn't just, this is how I want to worship. These were wicked places. In fact, the Bible tells us that many kings offered their children on the high places to appease other non-gods. Literally burnt sacrifices of their own children. That's what the high places were. It was a place of prostitution and idolatry. It was a place of immorality and debauchery. It was a place where they worshipped the moon and the sun and everything in between. Hezekiah comes on the scene and what he does is so important. He identifies what is wrong. And he's not afraid to lead and to say, this is wrong. I'm breaking it down. Well, we live in a world when it is so inappropriate, it is so <laughs> uncool to say, that is wrong, that ain't right, this is harmful, this is dangerous. But in our lives, what will serve us and our community the most is when we tear down the high places of our lives. When we allow idolatry to exist even in our homes or in our own hearts, God will excuse himself from the scene. Do you know that to be the truth? Why do you think the Bible goes to such lengths? Every king that comes, he did good. He did bad. God is watching and he cares about morality. Hezekiah did the right thing in breaking down these high places. And it says there in verse 4, <clears throat> and he cut down the groves, and he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made unto those days. The children of Israel did burn incense to it, and called it Nahashtim. Do you know that medical sign? We, we still use it today. Do you know the, the, the stick with the, with the snake on it? That is the universal sign for healing, for medical care, for health and help. Well, it began in the book of Numbers. I want to read this to you in Numbers chapter 21. Here's how the Bible lays it out as Israel is griping and complaining. They are bemoaning the leadership of Moses and the lot that God has given them. Numbers 21 and verse 6, the Bible says, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and bit the people, and much people of Israel died. 
Therefore the people came unto Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent, when he looked upon it, the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, this is way back when. This is in the olden days. This is in what they would call the good old days, you know, wandering around the desert for 40 years. Well, after that plague of snakes had come and gone, the same way that this plague that we are in right now will we'll change, it will come and go. There will be a new one. There will be other things. Life will happen. Israel kept that bronze serpent, carried it around with them for hundreds of years. We are about 400 years after Moses at this point. And the Bible says that the people of Israel, the people of Judah, they kept that thing. Somebody in the children of Israel wandering around the desert, it was their job to pack that thing up, wrap it in bubble wrap every time they moved, and they would take that thing around. When they would set up a new tabernacle, a new tent, they'd put up, the, they'd put up that serpent, and it was a good thing. Wouldn't you love to see the original thing? See the thing that Moses made with his own hands? In fact, you can go right now to Israel to Mount Nebo where Moses was able to look across into the promised land where he was never able to go. And there, there's a 40-foot tall serpent on a bronze. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I got a picture of it. You see, but they saw a good thing that God had done. And they turned it into a bad thing by making more of it than it was supposed to be. And they begin to worship it. The Bible says there in our text in verse 4 that they begin to burn incense to it. And Hezekiah comes along and he sees the high places and he sees the altars and he sees the child sacrifice and he sees the debauchery and the immorality in the name of religion, in the name of honoring God, whoever that might be. And he says, no, this is not what we will be. This is not who we, we cannot allow ourselves to be this. Why? Because God is watching and he cares about our morality. So what does he do? Can you imagine how unpopular that was? To tear down those high places? Can you imagine what it was to, to kick over those altars and, and to tear them apart and, and, and these, these large brass brazen bowls and they would set a fire underneath it and they would set the fire there and they would throw the child into the brazen bowl. Hezekiah destroyed it all. And he said, we're not done yet. There's one, more, there's one more snake in the midst that we've got. It's a good snake, but it's turned into a bad snake. He said, bring me that thing that Moses made. Man, they brought that thing out, and he says, here's what's going to happen. We're going to serve God, not the thing that reminds us of God. And the Bible says he dashed it in pieces. He broke the image and cut down the growth. He broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. He called it there at the end of verse 4, Nahushtan. Would you all say Nahushtan? Thank you. It almost sounds like you're telling me to be quiet. Hush. It means that worthless thing. That's what he said. He, he held it up and he says, this thing, you like this thing? This thing, is, this thing is worthless. I mean, this microphone is worthless. We don't talk about God in it. If God doesn't give us the breath to breathe into it, the microphone is good. It's, a good. it's a new microphone. We like our microphones. But if we ever elevate them to a place they do not deserve, we'll need to break them in pieces and come back and remember what is important in life. Do you have any brazed brass serpents in your life? Do we have any good things that have become bad things? I tell you what, I've got a lot of my dad's Bibles. They're precious to me. Because he had them and because of, well, they're the Bible. But did you know that it's just a Bible? I don't worship the Bible. I worship the God in the Bible. This here is leather and pages. 
We do not erect this. We do not stand this up. We hold it. We hold it dear. But it is the God of the Bible. It is not the pages that are important. I've also got a Bible on this. Hezekiah was right because he pointed out what was truly important. And he brought back to the original elements of worship that Judah had been missing for so long. So that, which by the way, the king of Assyria, he's coming. His, 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 name, is, um, his name is Sennacherib. He's coming. He's going to besiege the city. He's going to try to starve them out. He's going to try to steal their water source. But instead, Hezekiah is going to dig a tunnel and, and, and run the water inside the city of Jerusalem. It's really, really awesome stuff. When, when, when Sennacherib comes and besieges them, Hezekiah is going to be ready. You know why? When the plague of these locusts like Assyrians, they are coming. When they come and they are going to overwhelm little Judah. Judah is going to be ready. Do you know why? Because they had returned to a proper state of worship beforehand. They cut down everything that was inappropriate and everything that was unnecessary. That was the, this, Hezekiah was the first one to say, this is unessential. And he tore it down. The first thing Hezekiah did is that he tore some things down. The high places, he tore down Moses' serpent. And then lastly and second of all, he trusted in the Lord. Would you look in our scripture there? The Bible says in verse <clears throat> five, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. The Bible says he was a great king and I think it was really impressive and tremendous leadership what he did here in verses three and four. But the Bible says the greatness of Hezekiah was not in his actions but was in his beliefs. He trusted the Lord in such a way that set him apart from every other person and every other king that was before him or that would come after him. Hezekiah trusted God in tremendous ways. Think of how he had to trust him. Hezekiah became king of an entire nation at 25 years old. Would it, I've heard people say, you know, about the presidency, I wouldn't want to be the president. Would any of you want to be the president? Would any of you want to be a king? I know some politicians that want to be king, but would any of you want to be a king? We wouldn't, would we? We want to, we, uh, that heavy is, the, heavy is the crown, right? Oh, see, but Hezekiah comes in young and inexperienced. I can, <laughs> young and inexperienced, I can identify with that. And what set him apart, what set him up for success, what set him up for success the whole rest of the nation is that he trusted God in a tremendous way. I mean, did he have any good examples in his life? Who was his dad again? Ahaz. Remember? Did that which was wrong in the sight of the Lord, was evil in the sight of the Lord. He had no good examples in his life. He just had that still small voice. Just as a young boy, when God got a hold of his heart, and he had resolved to dare to be a Daniel, so to speak. He trusted in God, though he had no experience, though he had no examples, he trusted in the Lord. And little did he know, little Hezekiah, little young, inexperienced Hezekiah, little did he know, God was preparing him for a great siege, for a great shutdown. God was going to perform a miracle. God was going to do, but this is my brother-in-law, Dan. This is his favorite passage of scripture. You know, the angel comes out of heaven, kills 185,000 of them in one night, Trevor. Like, did all that before breakfast. Dan likes that. I don't know why. For some reason, he really likes that story. But he was being prepared a long time before. Do you think that God is preparing us in this time for what's coming down the road? Is, do you think that God has is, is been speaking to us and drawing us and calling to us and now in this time of shutdown, in this time of quarantine, in this time of sheltering in place, that the Lord is saying, hey, I'm talking to you now. Do you hear, can you hear me now? 
Isn't God shouting? Isn't the Lord speaking so clearly? When God comes back, could any of us say, well, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be this close. I didn't think it would be this soon. The Bible says when you see things happening, when you see things appearing, when all the nation, the Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew 21, when you see all the nations confused and raging, the seas boiling, not the actual seas, the tempest of the whole world boiling with confusion and uncertainty. Jesus said when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, what does that sound like the news you watched this morning? What does he say? Look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. How foolish would we be, church, to come into this season, strange, uncomfortable season, full of idolatry, full of, full of nahashtin, as if God's not saying, get rid of everything that's fake, get rid of everything that's worthless, and trust in me. You're not going to understand what I'm doing. I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. And lean on me, and look up, your redemption draws nigh. He's speaking He's calling. Let us listen. Let us respond in faith like Hezekiah. Father, we give you thanks and praise. We know, Lord, that there is no other God but you, and there's none like you. There's none beside you. Lord, your house this morning is full of your people that are looking to you and longing for you, Lord. Father, would you draw us to yourself? The Bible says that if we'll draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. The Bible tells us, Lord, that you stand at the door and knock, and if we would but open it, you would come in. and Sit down and share a meal with us, and we could commune together. Oh, Lord, how we need you today. How our country needs you today. How the world is in need of you today. Father, help us in this strange time to be preparing our hearts to meet you, your word says, prepare to meet thy God. In fact, you told Isaiah to tell Hezekiah that. So, Lord, would we be foolish today if we didn't say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Your people are here. Oh, God, help us as we respond to you by tearing down the high places and trusting you for what we cannot see. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, let's all stand. I want to ask you just to sing and pray and reflect and ask God to speak to your hearts. Has he been molding you? Has he been knocking off the rough edges? Is he doing a work in your heart? Is he speaking to you? Draw, Lord, draw. Sing one more time. Wider than snow.
It's a joy to be here and good to see each one of you. And as you leave today, you continue to pray and ask God to just guide in our life. And then, of course, at 10 o'clock, there'll be another service. And then next Sunday, we'll do the same thing over again. So if you can, come join us at either service. And then, of course, later, we're looking forward to the time when we all just come together. And uh, as you leave today, the ushers are back there with a tray. If you come prepared to give, we'll say thank you. And folks, thank you for what you have done. When there was no church, you remembered the church, and God bless you. We are grateful and thankful for your faithfulness here. We love you, and may you have a blessed day, and I'm going to stay on the stage, uh, but uh, we'll not shake hands as we normally do and hug necks, but I want to assure you, we love you and appreciate you. Father, thank you for the service. Thank you for your presence. Go with us now. Keep us, Lord, and watch over us and help us and bring us back in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you as our prayer. We love you. We love you. And we